And now, friends, on this holy day, let us gather in peace and unity as one before the grace and grandeur of life, as children before its great and loving mystery. In this hour, may we know anew the holy joy of human lives growing together so that this hour will imbue all those to come with that same gift. Come, let us worship together. May this light we now kindle remind us of the love that always heals the hope that always lives, and the peace that is always possible. Friends, I ask that now you join me in a time of prayer and meditation. Spirit of life, I find you in those humble places. The quiet, still spaces where I am held in. A greater love than myself. You are the wind in my breath, the fire in my soul, the subtle heartbeat of creation all around me. Oh, mystery, your love is unimposing, yet firm and steadfast, present to all those who would know your peace. You challenge me in my arrogance, and move me to listen deeply when I fail to see the fuller picture. Spirit of life, you find the gentle words to speak life into me and hold me when broken and hold me when all else around me feels broke, broken. You remind me that I am loved and saved just as I am. Your salvation is found in living life loved. Remind me of who I am, O oh holy mystery. Help me to see you in the small, everyday moments where you are found. Grant me the wisdom to listen for you and seek you in those unlikely and unexpected places. Amen. All eight of my great grandparents were Jews, Jewish people who immigrated to the United States around the year 1900. They came from Eastern Europe, areas that today are the countries Belarus, Lithuania, Poland, and Ukraine. They left their homelands and came to America to escape anti-Semitism and persecution of Jewish people. Their new lives in America were not easy. With no English language ability and no special skills, they remained poor, but they were safe. Two generations later, my father was the first in the family to earn a college degree. With his newly minted credentials, my parents grasped the next rung on the social mobility ladder and moved up, up into the echelons of the white 1960s American middle class and up out of the crowded tenements of Brooklyn to Schenectady, New York where my father began a long career as a nuclear physicist for the General Electric Company. In the 1960s, Schenectady had a small but vibrant Jewish community, mostly made up of transplants from New York City, like my parents. My parents initially found community through membership at a synagogue, and as a very young child, I learned that I was Jewish. Every year, General Electric the biggest employer in Schenectady gave its employees a day off on election day. This is how my dad, along with a bunch of other dads, showed up in my second grade classroom on election day, 1967. It was a practice of the Schenectady school system to invite dads to the schools on election day. It was an opportunity for teachers to showcase students' academic accomplishments and for dads to feel proud. In my classroom on that election day, 1967, most of the dads, like most of the children, were not Jewish, but there were a few besides my dad. It was a celebratory event and it was fun for all. That year, my parents decided to sell their small starter home in Schenectady and move up again, up into an outer suburb where they could now afford a bigger home with a two car garage. My father continued in the same job but we had a new house in a new neighborhood and I started to attend a new school, 
one in which I was the only Jewish child. My new school did not have the tradition of inviting dads to school on election day. Fewer people worked for GE in our new town, so dads of students in my new school did not have the day off. Oblivious to this fact, my mother thought she might bring the election day is dad's day practice to this suburban school. She arranged for my dad to visit my third grade class on election day, 1968. But when my dad came, he was the only one. When he arrived, my teacher, Mrs. Belowski, graciously welcomed him and gave him a seat at the side of the room. I felt a little embarrassed, but I was excited and happy. When my dad was settled in his seat, Mrs. Belowski took her post at the front of the room and quieted the children. She introduced my dad to the class and then she looked directly at him and said in a clear, deliberate voice, Mr. Miller, we hate you. The classroom froze. For a long moment, the only sound was the ticking of the second hand on the classroom clock and the pounding of my own heart in my chest. My dad, not a large man, sank lower in his chair. In a slow, soft voice, he said, why? Because you have the day off and we don't, Mrs. Belowski bellowed and the classroom erupted in laughter. My dad did not smile. He didn't say a word and he didn't move. I wanted to disappear. My dad never again came to my school and we never spoke about this incident but it had a lasting effect on me. What I understood in my nine-year-old mind was that the real reason they hated my dad and by association me was because he was different. He was a Jew and he had no business being some kind of GE smart ass braggart who gets election day off. I understood that this supposed joke was not a joke at all. And it became one part of my developing understanding that America is a complicated place. Some of our fellow Americans may have hated and resented my dad, but on that day, November 5th, 1968, after he left my classroom, he went to the polling booth and voted for the Democratic candidate, Hubert Humphrey. As you know, my dad's candidate lost to Richard Nixon. Sometimes it is hard to love my country, the United States of America. Is it even my country? But then I remember the gratitude I feel to be alive. Had my ancestors stayed in our native lands, it is likely I would not have been born. Despite the messages of hate, sometimes subtle and other times more explicit, my parents' civic participation kept our focus and our aspirations on ensuring that the America of the future remained a welcoming place. This vision of America is the one that let my Jewish ancestors come in, that let my dad go to college and thrive, that let us Jewish people participate in the civic fabric of the United States of America by letting us vote. That is the vision of our country that I choose and one which sadly we cannot take for granted. Edward Everett Hale was a Unitarian minister who died in 1909. Over the course of his life, he was, in addition to being a pastor, a celebrated writer, a supporter of the Union in the Civil War, and prominently progressive with regard to public education and religious tolerance. He was also the great nephew of Nathan Hale, the American revolutionary executed by the British for espionage in 1776. Nathan Hale was the one reported by the British who hung him to have proclaimed those famous last words on the gallows, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. He was likely reciting a line from a popular play of that time titled Cato that everyone would have known, but the line was attached to him thereafter. 
Our Unitarian minister, Hale, comes from that same stock, and among his other accomplishments was serving as chaplain of the United States Senate from 1903 until his death five and a half years later. And he recalled being asked once if, while in his role as chaplain, he prayed for the senators. His response was, no, I look at the senators and pray for the country. It seems like the Hales had a way with words in good times and troubled. And indeed, it seems like still our country needs prayers, many, many prayers for these troubled, troubled times. I miss the idealism of sixth grade, which was still grade school in my neck of the woods when I ran for school president. My platform was as simple as it was impossible. I promised more recess, less math, and Coca-Cola in the water fountains. I would not have been able to deliver on any of those promises, but that wasn't really the point. No candidate could deliver on our promises. The game was to simply outpromise one another. And of course, as part of the campaign, we plastered the walls with our signs and pinned our friends with our buttons. We made leaflets and put them on each other's desks. The candidates were even excused from class for the lunch periods on election day so that we could canvas our friends one last time as they drank their chocolate milk and ate their french fries. And then they voted at the end of their lunch periods at a long set of polling stations where they could, in private, fill out and submit the ballots that the teachers had just given them. And at the end of the day, we stared at the intercom speaker in each of our classrooms waiting to hear the results. The principal usually didn't do those announcements, but he did that day, and it just added a sense of authority and drama. He talked about bus changes and school pictures before finally getting to the election. He announced who won the secretary's race, and then the treasurer, and then the vice president, before finally getting to the president. And I remember all my friends in my class staring right at me as I stared at the speaker when he called out that our new president is Meredith something or other. I had not won. And to make matters worse, I wasn't really crazy about who did. One day in gym class, Meredith kicked a soccer ball that hit me square in the face. She claimed it was an accident, but all I know is I spent the rest of that day with a headache, and now she was my president. It's amazing that her aggressive nature didn't have us invading another elementary school. But that wasn't really my introduction to electoral politics, which I also look back upon fondly and with gratitude. That introduction came from my mom, who I remember taking me with her to vote in the 1980 presidential election. I remember the line to get in and the huge binder with everyone's name on it and the little booth with the curtain. And I remember my mom explaining her vote to me and why she made it in a very conversational way. I now know that the 1980 election was nasty and divisive as they all seem to be, but at that time, my mom presented voting as something that you think about, you take very seriously, and then make sure that you do, kind of a matter of fact. And after voting, I went to class, which was easy because she voted in my school, and then I had a typical day. I don't remember hearing that evening who won. I may have been in bed before anyone knew. I'm sure that I didn't even think about it. Compare that to recent elections that I've spent with the television on CNN's live coverage, a laptop with the Times' live coverage, and my cell phone refreshing 538's live blog until the wee hours of the morning. My grade school approach was much healthier. I should try to get back to that. But that obsession reflects not only my interest in the topic, which may be a bit much, but the stakes of elections these days, in which each one is breathlessly framed as the most important one ever. Elections of undeniably tremendous impact elections that will have consequences both positive and negative for everyone. The same news that brings me joy brings others sadness and vice versa, such that the night is a win and a loss for many. In these times, I try to remember that piece by Rabindranath Tagore, the Bengali writer, who has a few excerpts included in our gray hymnal. Number 529 is my favorite, and it includes this idea of his the same stream of life that runs through my veins night and day runs through the world and dances in rhythmic measures. It is the same life that shoots in joy through the dust of the earth in numberless blades of grass and breaks into tumultuous waves of leaves and flowers. It is the same life that is rocked in the ocean cradle of birth and death in ebb and flow. I feel my limbs are made glorious by the touch of this world of life, 
and my pride is from the life throb of ages, dancing in my blood this moment. And I try to remember Gwendolyn Brooks in her poem, Paul Robeson, where she also reminds us of our fundamental oneness. She writes, that time we all heard it, that time cool and clear, cutting across the hot grit of the day, the major voice, the adult voice, foregoing rolling river, foregoing tearful tale of bale and barge and other symptoms of an old despond, warning in music words devout and large that we are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. And I try to remember good old Rumi, that Sufi mystic who insisted that the separateness between people is an illusion, that we are really one. It's the same illusion that we hold when we imagine that we are separate from God. We aren't. We are one with the holy and with one another in mystic and earthy union with life transcendent and imminent, holy and human. For Rumi, the longing for the holy comes from a place of connection to the holy that we'd like to know better, feel more acutely, and embrace more holy. You can't really long for what you don't really know, and so the longing is to be sought and embraced. Seek longing in Rumi's world. And similarly, the longing for what we might call a beloved community comes from a place of knowing that we already are a community, already connected and interdependent, but we'd like to know the diverse glories of that space better, feel them more acutely, and embrace them more wholly. He wrote this in verse many times, perhaps most famously with the lines, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field, I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in the grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. I hold these wise ones in my mind and heart these days quite often, turning to them for counters to what industries of divisive polarity seductively insist that we are hopelessly separate from one another. They remind me of a higher truth, one to which my spirit seeks to ascend, for which it yearns that we are, as Maya Angelou wrote, more alike than unalike, that our differences matter, but less before the holy than, do, than does our sameness, and that regardless of what happens in any election on the day after the votes have ta are tallied, we'll have to build a world together. Perhaps the greatest gift that we as a faith can bring to that post-election work is that belief, that little blip of theology that makes human an inhumane political industry, or the increasingly radical idea that even those who disagree can hold each other in respect and dignity. And being worthy of those basic human elements of respect and dignity means that we speak and lead and listen with those principles in mind. We counter and contest in the political realm with every ounce of everything we have in the interest of building a world more just and loving, but we never settle for the easy hatred and othering of this insidious industry, these leaders, and these times. We counter it with our faith of love, respect, and dignity, believing that they are not only expressed as a godly longing for a world more holy, but as a good people for a world more human. Consider the poem, The Low Road, in which Marge Piercy wrote in part, two people can keep each other sane and give support, conviction, love, massage, hope, sex. Three people are a delegation, a cell, a wedge. With four, you can play games and start a collective. With six, you can rent a whole house and have pie for dinner with no seconds and make your own music. 13 makes a circle, a hundred fill a hall, a thousand have solidarity and your own newsletter, 10,000 community and your own papers, a hundred thousand, a network of communities, a million, our own world. It goes one at a time. It starts when you care to act. It starts when you do it again after they say no. It starts when you say we and know who you mean. In each day, you mean one more. Piercy's poem is set in a social justice context, and this excerpt leaves out some earlier lines about those with power acting in abusive ways. But her response applies to building community, to building true democracy in any context. And her conclusion is that, starts, is that it starts when you act, 
And it starts when you say we and each day mean one more. The action reflects the belief or is linked to the belief or is one with the belief. We celebrate action and as a faith, we're pretty good at it. And frankly, so are those who oppose us in the political realms. But the sickness of this day is one of belief. It's this awful notion that our opponents are our enemies and all that dehumanization that follows. The answer for us as a faith is to rise above that which divides and seeks to demolish and build instead that which contests in respect and dignity. Our faith is meant to empower the innate goodness in people, to shine the light of reason and optimism on the basic human goodness that not just neighbor can and does offer neighbor, but that stranger can and does offer stranger. This starts in our hearts as we hold and pray for our enemies, a loving kindness meditation perhaps, or a good wish, or a visualization of the people who love them and who they love. It then fills our hearts and minds with a sense of respect and dignity that may not ever lead to political agreement, but will lead to a common sense of worth and value. They who we oppose and against whom we vote do not become objects of our political ire, but they remain human beings innately good, with whom we are more alike than unalike. Our faith calls us to be active politically. Church and state are always in constant tension and cohort. There really is no separation, one in which silence is its own voice. And so our faith has always been politically active and likely always will. Hale himself, with his prayers for the people, was a minister, a chaplain in the Senate, and an activist in several ways. But like his, our activism and engagement must reflect a theology and assurance a belief greater than the political differences between us. Our politics must be guided by theology, rooted in belief, practiced in praise of our shared common humanity. And yes, we try hard to win. And believe me, I want to win. I want to win a lot. I want to win way more than I actually do win. And I want my faith to make me a better participant in democracy by refusing to allow me the easy othering orchestrated by platforms and pundits who profit off of that sickness. Our faith is more about people than their profit. And this is the country that we can choose again and again, not one in which we live in constant suspicion and fear of people who are different, but one in which we can vote, vote for our values and live in a greater sense of unity than politics seems to allow. We can choose a better way for everyone, a way of dignity, a way of hope, a way of love. This will heal us and it will help heal our country. May it be so and amen. For our benediction, go forth grateful for the moments before you, the breath within you, the people among you, and the spirit guiding you toward lives of love and kindness. And go forth knowing that you are held always and always with everyone else by that great love of no beginning and never ending. Go in peace and amen.